All right, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to our special topic webinar, How Fabulous Are Spiders? Thank you everyone for joining us today. Before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping rules. Please everyone, if you could mute your line. Um, I have everyone muted right now, but if you happen to come unmuted, please mute your line. You can use the chat box to ask us any questions and we'll be answering all the questions at the end of the webinar. For any additional questions that you may think of, you can email us at education at nola.gov. And today's webinar does not offer any CEUs. Next, you'll hear from Dr. Claudia Rigo, the Director of New Orleans Mosquito Control, and she'll be introducing today's guest speaker. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today. And just as a quick reminder, this webinar is going to be recorded and we will place it on our YouTube channel, uh, likely by the end of next week. So thanks everybody for taking the time. And today it is my pleasure to introdu introduce our speaker, Mr. Zach Lehman. He's a curator of anim the animal collections at the Audubon Butterfly Garden and Insectarium. So we're super excited to have him today. Just a little bit about Zach. He was born and raised in New Orleans and attended Duke University where he earned a degree in history and anthropology. Um, he began working at the Audubon uh, Nature Institute in 1992 and has been there ever since. So for about eight years or so when the Audubon Butterfly Garden and Sectarian was being built, he served as the point person for animal acquisition and scientific content and also worked on exhibit um, design ideas. So just for everyone to know, it's been really super interesting because many of the um, the rearing facility, one of the rearing facilities um, that they have was in one of our facilities. And so it was always a great opportunity to go in and see what they were doing and just see these beautiful insects from all over the world. Um, with a combination of uh, zoo and museum experience, he's got also a biology degree from the University of New Orleans. He has tons of field experience and collecting um, he has a lot of information about natural history fields. Uh, Zach gained a wealth of information about insects and their relatives, of course, and he shares this knowledge with more than uh, over more than uh, three decades. So he's been around. He's a very popular speaker, actually, has been on national television and also folks around the country invite him uh, to do webinars in person, all kinds of things. So we're very, very happy to have him here today. And just also for you guys to know, uh, we have had Bug Fest, uh, I think for, we've had three Bug Fest uh, uh, festivals at our facility in combination with Audubon. And uh, Zach has been our bug chef uh, on this, as well as uh, uh, providing musical entertainment. <laughs> so we hope to have another bug fest in 2023. So we'll make sure to get you the information. But with that, I'd like to turn it over uh, to Zach and get it started. And for those that have not seen him speak before, please fasten your seatbelt, okay? Because <laughs> it's going to be quite a ride. All right, Zach, uh, take it over. Thank you very much. I didn't know you were going to do the long version of the uh, of the uh, uh, CV. <laughs> yes, um, we're deserving of the long version. Thanks. Thanks for having me, everybody. I think um, on advice of mosquito control, I should go ahead and hit my share button now so I can at least get my uh, my opening slide up. So give me just a moment here, everybody. Thanks for your patience and thank you for uh, your attendance. It looks like we got like 50 people in change here, which is wonderful. Um, so just a second and I will have this uh, this talk, uh, I think, uh, up and running. Mm, mm, there you go. you there it is. through it, let us know. So your share button is going to be at the top right hand side, a little box with an arrow. Yep, we should be. We should be ready to rock and roll here. Um, uh, the last time I did this, which was just a few minutes before we came on live, <laughs> there we go. it took a minute to load, and there it is. All right. Okay, Here's good. Um, so uh, I guess I guess Claudia alluded to the fact that um, I speak fairly quickly, uh, so I will try to slow it down enough that uh, some of the more uh, pertinent and interesting things that I hope to get across today will come through. And um, I'll make a little apology in advance, not knowing the expertise or experience of everybody who's here, there's gonna be some fairly basic stuff. Uh, and then there will be some more detailed uh, things about spider biology and natural history, which I will try to 
explain so that um, vocabulary just doesn't get thrown out without uh, uh, any sort of explanatory note. But I always like to start off with a little humor. And the, the wonderful thing about this is not only is it just funny in its own right, but it hints at the fact that spiders are able to capture prey that is a lot bigger and perhaps even stronger than they are by virtue of a couple of very special glands. They've got their venom glands, which not all spiders have, and their silk glands, which all spiders do possess. Um, depending on the species of spider, there may only be three different sorts of silk made by an individual. Uh, other species, I think the, the max is six or seven different kinds of silk can be created. So silk and venom, they're both liquids. Uh, the difference is that silk dries instantaneously on contact with air. But the fact of the matter is that if you're a web building spider, you can uh, retain prey uh, with this uh, with this incredibly elastic and incredibly strong substance known as silk, and then you can subdue it either by paralyzing or ultimately killing it with uh, this other uh, glandular secretion, your venom. It's pretty cool. Just to make sure everyone knows what we are talking about, uh, you do not get to be in the spider club if you have three body parts and six legs and wings. Spiders are built very differently than insects. They are animals. A lot of people don't think that bugs, for lack of a more precise term, are animals. But uh, if you use oxygen and eat other animals and plants to survive, you get your animal membership card. So spiders are animals that have two main body regions, eight legs, and they do not have wings and they do not have antennae either. Now, to be more specific, uh, if you, well, it's, it's close to Halloween, so this is kind of neat. And if you look at uh, various iterations of spiders that we see as decoration or cartoons, usually there's only one body part. And if there are two, a lot of times uh, the legs are attached to the back of the body. But you can see from this particular slide, the legs of a spider are attached to the front of its body, which is sometimes referred to as the head. And that's not incorrect, but usually we'll use the term cephalothorax. Uh, some people who are uh, particularly into araniology, which is specifically the study of spiders, refer to the front part of a spider's body as the prosoma and the back as the opistosoma. So uh, if you want to show off with your spidery pals, that's, that's a set of terms you can use and they, they are correct as well. Uh, I like to point out the pedipalps because we're going to talk a little bit more about them in detail later. But if you look right next to the spider's calissery, uh, which have the fangs at the end, uh, you will see these things that are basically built like small legs. And on male spiders, they are particularly important. Uh, when you look at the underside of a spider, you will see uh, in this diagram uh, book lungs. Uh, the more primitive spiders like tarantulas and trapdoor spiders and their kin have two sets of book lungs. So they have four book lungs altogether. Uh, the, the more evolutionarily advanced or recent spiders have one pair of book lungs and usually just anterior to the spinnerets, they have a spiracle. They, they, they have an opening. Uh, so there are two ways that spiders get oxygen into their body. Typically, they have this little spiracle by their spinnerets and they have their book lungs as well. And uh, you'll also notice on the diagram here, that uh, near the front end or the head end of the abdomen on the underside is something called the epigyne. That is the genital opening, and it is in the same spot on males and females. So we can get a little more into spider reproductive biology later uh, because it's part of what I'm going to talk about, and we can also uh, do Q&A about it afterwards. So those are a few of the uh, things. Uh, uh, the last thing uh, uh, morphologically that I wanted to point out uh, in terms of, you know, what a spider's body looks like is that there are normally six spinnerets, three pairs of spinnerets, but uh, that's not always the case, but they are always at the back of the body and it is from there that silk emanates. And you can't always see the spinnerets very easily, but uh, getting back to the primitive spiders, like tarantulas and their kin, there are usually a pair of very long spinnerets that are noticeable. So if you're just interested in observing spiders, you know, uh, what's out there? How do I look for them? Uh, we can broadly divide spiders into those that use webs for prey capture and those that do not. And we see lots of both of them. 
Um, but as a general rule, spiders that live in a web and use a web for prey capture have abdomens that are quite large compared to their head, especially if it's a female. If it's a male, uh, that, that rule does not apply. And we'll, we'll get into male-female differences in just a moment here. But if you look at spiders that have to actively hunt or uh, ambush their prey without the use of silk for catching what they want to eat, normally the head and the abdomen have a little bit more uh, even proportion. As you can see in the bottom left-hand corner here, there's a, a pretty Australian wolf spider and a uh, green lynx and a nice jumping spider from the desert southwest. Uh, oops, I just hit the wrong button. Excuse me. Okay, so you may look at a spider and be curious as to whether or not it is a male or a female. In this photograph, we are looking at two adults of the same species and getting back to those pedipalps, those little leg-like structures that are near uh, the front of the body. You'll notice that the male has uh, pedipalps that look like they've got a little mitten or a boxing glove on the end. It is in the pedipalp that a mature male spider, an adult, will store his sperm and transfer it to the female. And what you will see in most, if not all, of the world's spiders is that the male will, after reaching sexual maturity, at some point make a sperm web and he will deposit sperm, which comes out of the genital opening on the underside of the abdomen, onto that web and then immediately draw the sperm up into both of his palps. And uh, we put the word charge in quotes here, but that is charging his palps. It's filling each of his palps with sperm so that he can then go off in search of a mate. But you don't see this when spiders are immature. So typically on any given species of spider, males and females can't be distinguished until they are near adult size. And then you can see uh, differences in the weight of the female because her abdomen is bigger, or in the pedipalps of the male, which will get this enlarged end, usually one molt before adulthood. Uh, and then once they're adults, you not only have uh, the pedipalp difference, you have a size difference, which you can see here, but we're gonna see a more extreme example of it in just a moment. And there are often color and marking differences. So with that said, here we see some web building spiders, male and female. On the left-hand side are golden silk spiders. And you can see that the male is about one fifth the size of the female. He's about one fiftieth her weight. And on the right hand side are a pair of southern black widows. <clears throat> and you can see that the male's markings are quite different. You can see his pedipalps are so big they're they're practically half the size of his head. And um, and so these are all adults. And you can see how much larger the females are than the males. Now let me advance my slides a little bit so that I know where I am. So one of the things that we have all heard since we were very young is that black widows are famous for eating their mates. But what I always like to remind people of is that in spiders, you have a predatory animal in which the female is larger and stronger than the male. And what this means is that in most cases, male spiders have to watch their step because if the female is more hungry than she is amorous, he's going to get eaten and not necessarily be passing along any of his genetic material. So there are all kinds of wonderful and fascinating and bizarre ways that spiders uh, have evolved uh, to court. And in some cases, there is actual male sacrifice. The male intentionally throws himself, if you will, at the fangs of the female. And the idea is that she will have more robust eggs. And so it is increasing the overall fitness for both of these of these individuals. Um, that is not the norm. And so what I've shown here is a really nice set of pictures of long jawed orb weavers in which uh, these toothed margins on the calissery make it so that when the male and female lock their mouth parts together, they're sort of stuck there. And the male holds the female. She's moderately compliant in all of this, but uh, when he mates, he holds her. And then when he's done, he lets go and runs like hell. It's very romantic. So that's just a little joke there, but it's also how long jawed orb weavers go about the business of courting. Uh, there's my next slide. You can, if you're interested in observing spiders, learn a lot about them without seeing 
the animal itself. Uh, in particular, web architecture uh, is something that can be diagnostic, uh, uh, sometimes down to the level of species. And it's really fun if you're if you're uh, a naturalist uh, to just sort of go about and look at some silk and go, I know what made that. It's really kind of cool. And in some cases, the spider might still be associated with the web, but not be in plain view. And the more you learn about where the spider rests, if it is not in the middle of its web, the more you can check out uh, the periphery uh, or some other hiding place and figure out not only who made the web, but where he or she might be hanging out. And on a similar note, egg sacs can be diagnostic as well. Uh, I am sure that a lot of you are familiar with brown widow spiders as opposed to brown recluses. Uh, brown widows were, I'm going to say, virtually non-existent in Louisiana until uh, sometime after Hurricane Katrina. And there are a couple of different hypotheses as to how they got to be here, but it's quite clear that uh, from from uh, 2006 on, they became very successful very quickly. And uh, the egg sacs of brown widows are notable because they are spiky. The picture of uh, the brown widow egg case here, which is a uh, letter F, isn't really a great representation of it because the spikes aren't quite so prominent. And this photograph has the whole egg sac looking a little more yellowy green than tan, but that is a brown widow egg sac for those of you who aren't familiar with it. And another interesting diagnostic feature on spiders is the arrangement of their eyes. Um, I wanted to talk about exceptions to rules a fair bit uh, during the course of this uh, this talk today. And um, so I'm going to back up before I drill down on eyes and uh, reiterate something I said way back at the beginning, um, about, about 10 or 15 minutes ago, which is that not all spiders have venom glands. Um, in my line of work, where we do a lot of uh, uh, public interaction, public programs, educational uh, presentations, you will hear people say, well, all spiders are venomous. They're just not all dangerous to people. And in fact, the first part of that statement is not true. Not all spiders are venomous because some of them lack venom glands completely, including a family that we have right here in Louisiana, but I did not include a picture of in this presentation. Uh, and those are called the feather-legged spiders. Um, so if you want to look those up, they're, they're kind of uh, one of those neat little exceptions to the rule. So now we can go back to eyes. Most people, if they know a little bit about spiders, uh, may have heard that spiders have eight eyes. And there is a qualifier here, which is usually. There are many spiders in the world that have only six eyes, some that have four, two, one, and even zero, uh, which is something you find in cave species uh, more often than not, where there is no light and therefore uh, the need for any light sensing organ either was never there or uh, disappeared over the course of time. But if you look at this uh, pair of pictures, uh, you can see examples of eye arrangement. And this is um, a feature that we will say uh, in, in, in the classification and taxonomy world is highly conserved, which is to say it doesn't vary a lot. So if, so if eye arrangement is highly conserved, that means that, for example, if I look at a wolf spider, I'm going to see the same general eye arrangement, whether I'm looking at a wolf spider in New Orleans or in New Guinea. Uh, and by way of example, the wolf spider uh, in the image on your right is in the lower right, where it says Lycosidae 2. Um, Lycosids are, are wolf spiders. And so you can see in that, in that bottom right picture, four small eyes and then two big eyes. And then those two little dashes are meant to represent the fact that those, those uh, last two eyes are on the top of the head. So they're not front facing. So that's a little bit about uh, spider eyes. And, and if you want to look at these, of course, you need to get a loop. You need to have a good, strong uh, 15 to 20 X magnifying system of some kind. And that way you can look at spider eyes. Spiders like insects have an exoskeleton. They have a hard outer skin. And because it is rigid, uh, the spider can't grow because the exoskeleton doesn't grow with the animal the way our bones, for example, and our muscles do. So these are boneless animals. Um, and when it is time for a spider to grow, which they do periodically, uh, more so during the younger part of their life than the latter part, uh, their old exoskeleton will split along predetermined lines and the animal very slowly works its way out of its old exoskeleton 
And at that point in time, even though it's very delicate and vulnerable, the new exoskeleton can stretch and expand before it hardens. And that is how the spider physically increases in size. And usually, spiders will have a terminal molt, which is to say they'll have a final molt, at which point they are sexually mature and they're able to reproduce. But some of the longer lived spiders, again, this would be found most commonly in tarantulas and their close kin, they will continue to molt after adulthood. So you get a sexually mature female tarantula, she may be say six years old, and if she lives to be 16 years old, she may continue to molt one or two times every year uh, between ages six and 16. So now I will spend a, a good bit of time with y'all going over first some common web building spiders that we see in and around New Orleans. I'm, I'm operating under the assumption that, that most of the folks who are listening to this webinar are here or near here. Uh, and then we will look at uh, some spiders that don't use webs to get their prey. So the big words that are here are the common names of these families. So there is a family called cobweb weavers. They're also referred to as comb-footed spiders. And there, are, there really are a, a trio of common species around here, but I only showed a picture of two of them. Uh, the one in the upper left-hand corner, which makes those pale, very round egg sacs, uh, is Steatota triangulosa. And very often they will get under pieces of furniture that are just a couple of inches off the ground. And as a homeowner, you will see little uh, white or white and black spots all very close to each other on the ground, which is the fecal matter of the spider. And you don't see the spider because she is upside down, tucked up on the underside of that furniture. So she has a very small three-dimensional web and she's catching all manner of insects that are in your house and, uh, and then defecating subsequently. So uh, I hope I may have solved a mystery for some of you right then and there. Um, both what the spotting is and how to find the thing that made the spotting. The other spider uh, is larger, although you don't see that in, in these two photographs, and that is uh, the common house spider or American house spider. And in that photo, a bunch of her spiderlings are coming out of an egg sac. Uh, this family, by the way, cobweb weavers, includes black widows. And we'll talk more about widows uh, closer to the tail end of the webinar. But uh, those are two of our common cobweb weavers, and they tend to be associated with people and buildings. Uh, and in fact, uh, the next two families of spiders that I'm gonna talk about are also highly uh, synanthropic. Syn means with, anthro means uh, human. So synanthropic species are species we find in association with humans. And many of them, to use another uh, fun little term, are domiciliary, which is to say they are specifically found in and around buildings or domiciles that people make. So these two spiders, these cobweb weavers and many others are found in and uh, just on the outside of buildings. The one that I didn't show here is called the rusty house spider. So you can look that one up or the red, I'm sorry, the red house spider. Obviously, if something's called a cellar spider, you can you can figure out where, you know, <laughs> a lot of them are found. But we don't have a lot of cellars in New Orleans, right? Um, I actually grew up in a house uh, in uptown New Orleans that had a basement, which was strange. And, and believe it or not, it was well built enough that it didn't flood um, often. Uh, but the, uh, the cellar spiders are typically going to make an irregular web. It doesn't have a nice geometric pattern. And the same holds true for the cobweb weavers. I'll go back just to emphasize this. Uh, you can see in the lower right hand corner between mom and the spiderlings, uh, a very messy tangle of silk. And you can see that in the other uh, image as well. So uh, cobweb weavers and cellar spiders make what we call an irregular web. It does not have a distinct pattern. Cellar spiders have webs that are very lightweight. And if you blow on them, the whole silken structure moves in the air. Um, they are very often found in and on the outside of buildings. And the two species that are on the left here include on the top, a native one, uh, Falsus phalangioides, and on the bottom, uh, which has kind of an interesting, uh, almost triangular rear end to its abdomen, that's Crossopresa lionii. Uh, I don't believe either of these have common names, which is why I'm uh, bothering you with their with their binomial. Um, 
But Crossopresa lionii, this one on the bottom left, is an introduced species. I think it is Asian in origin. And uh, like all cellar spiders, you can see uh, there on the bottom right, they carry a very open egg sac in their fangs until the spiderlings emerge. Usually the egg sacs of spiders, like you saw uh, in the previous picture here, are uh, dark enough and heavy enough with silk that you can't see the eggs that are inside, but that's not true with cellar spiders. And then we have the wall spiders. These are very small spiders. They are um, around the size of a termite to give you an idea uh, of, of uh, their length. And you'll notice that the legs on this spider all seem to sort of start by pointing upwards and then curve a little bit backwards. This posture is real typical of a wall spider. And true to their name, you find them most often in a junction where the window frame meets the sill or where the wall meets the floor or where two walls come together. They love to set up shop in right angles and they make these very small little tents of silk with some lines that radiate out and the radiating lines, which you really can't see with the naked eye, are very good for capturing small prey uh, that's wandering along these right angles in buildings. Uh, so ants make up a lot of their prey and they, they rush out from this little tent where they rest and they run in little circles very quickly putting silk down around the prey that gets caught in their capture webs and uh, that's how they hunt. Uh, one of the neatest things I ever saw since you rarely find these things just out in nature, they're almost always associated with buildings. Uh, the mosquito control department years ago was studying the termites in the trees of Armstrong Park and they had wooden dowels in the trees. And at one point I was with the, the fellow who was doing the work and he pulled the dowel out of the tree and the tree had termites in it. And when the dowel came out, the soldier termites came to this opening to investigate and defend. And there was literally an encampment of about eight of these wall spiders in the bark of the live oak where they had beautiful little fissures to make their webs. And they would just feast on the termites as they came out. Uh, it was a very interesting little phenomenon. So now we will talk about some spiders that do not use webs for prey capture. Uh, these are the sack spiders and the very closely related ghost spiders. Uh, you will, by the way, and I'm just going to jump out ahead of this, uh, read in some online sources that there is a type of sack spider, uh, Chiricanthium is the genus, it's called the yellow sack spider, that has a venom that's dangerous to people. And I'm here to tell you that there is no good hefty set of data to back that up. So if you see one of these spiders and you remember this webinar and your only thought is, oh, sack spider, wait a minute, I remember reading they were dangerous and this looks like that thing Zach showed us. Don't worry about it. Um, it is very common around here to see our sack spiders moving around at night. Uh, that's when they hunt actively, usually on plants. Uh, for prey, and they will get in curled up leaves in the daytime and make a little silken retreat for themselves, kind of like what you see. It's been torn open here, but but you can you can see that that's what's going on in the upper left hand uh, portion of this slide. But because they like these tight little curled up spaces, a lot of times sack spiders will get on your car where the rubber gasketing meets the frame of the car or where the window goes up into its housing. Uh, or where the windshield connects to the front of the car's frame. And a lot of times you open your car door and you close it, and one of these things skitters across your windshield. Um, I used to joke and call them car spiders, even though that's not a common name that's <laughs> legitimate uh, for that reason. Uh, but that's a little bit about sack spiders, and they will occasionally get in the home. It's usually by accident, and they usually don't do too well when they are indoors. Ah, then we have the jumping spiders. What a great group of spiders they are. Um, these are all uh, common ones. Uh, these are just a, a set of species. You can read their names on here uh, that are in and around the New Orleans area. I will have to say um, we were thinking once uh, in the old uh, iteration of our insectarium about putting a big uh, bronze sculpture on the outside and someone said well, why don't we make it a spider and we can make it look like it's crawling up the building and I was lobbying for the the twin flagged jumping spider the one that's in the center here because of all the spiders particularly in this area uh, that I know of it's it's most similar to the New Orleans Saints in its colors uh, it's 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 got black and gold and white it's kind of neat jumping spiders have excellent vision 
and they are active daytime hunters and they will typically spot prey and stalk it and pounce on it uh, uh which is how they earn their common name and um we'll talk a little bit more about jumping spiders later because they're so darn cool i've got a whole nother section of this little presentation uh dedicated to jumping spiders right, where am i lost my place here we go we talked a little bit earlier about wolf spiders. Uh, you might even be able to appreciate uh, in, in um, the lower right hand picture, the eye arrangement and how it is similar to the eye arrangement that we were looking at a little bit earlier. Wolf spiders are one of only two families in the world that carry their egg sacs by their spinnerets. There are a few different spiders that carry their egg sacs in their fangs for a portion of time or for the entire time while the, uh, the eggs are developing. But wolf spiders uh, have not only the unusual distinction of attaching it to their egg sac so they can continue to feed while the spiderlings are developing, but they have the unique distinction of having the spiderlings get on top of the mother's abdomen for about a week or so before they disperse and begin to live independently. Uh, wolf spiders are nocturnal hunters, and if you want to do something really cool, go out to some place at night that is uh, relatively undeveloped, you know, not a lot of asphalt or concrete. And if you shine a bright light at, at ground level, you will see the eyes of wolf spiders shining back at you. Uh, there's a bright yellowish green uh, reflection you get from a structure in the eyes of wolf spiders. And uh, if you have a good, strong flashlight, uh, you can spot them that way. But we do have other brown spiders uh, in South Louisiana uh, that'll get confused uh, for wolf spiders if you're not familiar with what you're looking at. Fishing spiders, as their name suggests, are often associated with water, but not always. And you can find some of them at a considerable distance from water. Um, but where wolf spiders uh, can be common, even in the middle of the city, you really do have to get uh, a little bit more into rural, natural areas uh, to find fishing spiders in good numbers. They will occasionally take minnows that are, you know, the size of a cricket, the size of the fishing spider's body. These are fairly large spiders, by the way. Uh, wolf spiders can be large, but it depends what species you're looking at. There are no fishing spiders that are really small. Um, and the, the ones on the right and the left here, um, they're, they're decent size. Their bodies can be about an inch in, uh, or more long, and then their legs can be uh, about two inches long. So you get a pretty good spread from some of these fishing spiders. They often will rest on vertical surfaces like tree trunks. And um, in addition to catching aquatic prey, they will eat terrestrial stuff as well, whether they're on land or whether it is a terrestrial bug that happens to hit the water by accident. But fishing spiders can do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, first of all, they can use the surface tension of the water to skitter or run across the top of the water but if they are disturbed, in particular, if they're threatened by a predator, they can break the surface tension by forcefully pushing down and they can go directly under the water, usually climbing on vegetation. And you can see in this picture in the lower right here that the spider looks silver. And the reason for that is that it has hairs all around its body that will trap air bubbles. So the silver color you're seeing is an air bubble or multiple air bubbles around this fishing spider. And while it is underwater, it is encased with this air and it is able to breathe. So the fishing spider having, let's just say, run away from a bird or a lizard can hang out on this twig underwater for 20 to 30 minutes. And usually by that time, the predator is gonna give up, the spider comes right back up and is fine and dandy. And uh, it's a really neat phenomenon to watch if you can see it in person. And the third type of spider that we have around here that is big and brown, like fishing spiders and some wolf spiders, are huntsman spiders. Uh, this is our only huntsman spider in South Louisiana, and it is an introduced species, but uh, it has been here for a long time, uh, and it is moderately well established, but not invasive. It does not seem to be problematic environmentally. This is a female on the left and a male on the right which some people might think is a recluse because of that mark on the top of its head. But um, I always like to tell people, this is one of my more important uh, sentences. If you want to understand how nature works well, you have to have a picky eye for details. Some of you may know that recluses are also called violin spiders or fiddleback spiders. And that's because on the top of their head, not their abdomen, 
they have a violin shaped mark. So remember what I've just said, look closely at the male here, the one on the right, and appreciate with me the fact that that doesn't really look like a violin. It looks like a triangle. And we'll look at recluses later and you'll go, oh, of course, now that, now that we're focusing on this difference, it's obvious. So the huntsman spiders that we have here are decidedly domiciliary. I don't think I've ever found one in the out of doors, even though there's a nice picture of one on vegetation here. And they like to hide during the day in places where their body is very much pressed up uh, against something such that both the top and bottom of their body have something near them. There's a technical term for this. It's called thigmotaxis. Uh, our, our, our roaches are very similar in this regard. They like to have something sort of pressing on their belly and touching their back at the same time. So huntsman spiders will get behind furniture um, in folds of things. Uh, they'll get behind mirrors or artwork. And then at night, they come out on the open vertical surface. In nature, they would do this on a tree. And so anything trafficking that vertical surface at night is good prey. So around, around here, that would mean that they eat a lot of roaches. If you have huntsmen in your house, you probably have roaches. Um, but they also go after beetles and katydids and crickets and moths, all things that would be on tree trunks at night. So getting back to uh, the care of the egg sac, I was referencing some of this earlier, but now I'll be specific about it. The fishing spiders belong to a family that uh, also include nursery web spiders. And both fishing spiders, which are on the left here, and nursery web spiders, which is the one on the right, do the same thing with their egg sacs. They carry an egg sac in their fangs for about a week, and then they construct a nursery. They take uh, a few leaves and some silk, and they set that egg sac up in the middle of this tent or nursery that they've made, and they guard it until the spiderlings have not only hatched, but usually dispersed. So what you're seeing on the right here is uh, a female, and obviously the spiderlings have, uh, have all emerged. They're probably surrounding the egg sac so you can't see it, and eventually they'll go off and on their merry way. In contrast to this, the huntsman spider that we have locally will hold a flattened egg sac, not a round one like this, but a flattened egg sac in her fangs, and she will hold it until the spiderlings emerge. So that's a little bit about how they reproduce. And now we're going to get into some more web building spiders, but we're going to get into ones that you will typically find in the out of doors. Uh, the orb weavers are a well-known family. These, this is your classic uh, circular web with spokes coming out. Although um, I would hasten to add that the orb web has evolved uh, multiple times among spiders and not every spider that makes a circular web with radial lines coming out or spokes is in this family. But we're going to start first with the largest family of spiders that make an orb web, which are called the orb weavers. The spotted orb weavers belong to the genus Neoscona, and there are two species that occur. You can find them within feet of each other sometimes uh, in our in our wet woods down here. Um, you'll recognize the underside of a spotted orb weaver as having those four cream colored marks that you see in the lower right. But one of these Neoscona species is quite variable in its color and pattern. And those are the three pictures where they're on the top. And then the other one uh, is almost always uh, banded with uh, sort of tan and black legs along the distal part. And then the part that's proximal to the body is bright red. And you can see a, a pretty nice cross shape on the top of it. Whereas that cross is sometimes pretty occluded on uh, the other species, the one that's up on top there. This is probably one of my favorite orb weavers, uh, the giant lichen orb weaver. A big female has an abdomen that is the size of a ping pong ball. And they make a very interesting orb web because they almost always have an anchor line, an attachment line that is several feet long. And it goes up, up, up to some curled over leaf. And if you find the spider in the middle of the day, you'll see the web, it's empty. You'll see this extremely long attachment line. And if you follow it, you'll see a curled up leaf and the spider is, is up under there. It's a beautiful spider. And then we have our, uh, I would say, getting to be better and better known, uh, spiny-backed orb weavers. Um, you can see what I've written here. Uh, 
I will go ahead and say what I wrote here just because uh, it'll save you the trouble. Don't call these crab spiders. There's an entire family of spiders called crab spiders that have four long front legs and four short back legs and usually don't make webs. And uh, those are the true crab spiders. Uh, the spiny backed orb weavers um, are really quite endearing. Uh, they only get to be about the size of one of your fingernails, depending on how big your nails are, I suppose. And uh, typically we get white and yellow as our most common color forms here. The orange ones, I remember some student of Terry Christensen's at Tulane years ago did a, did a big survey and he found one in 35 or one in 40 individuals is orange. Um, I collected uh, 42 of these things yesterday at St. Bernard State Park and five of them were orange. So I got a lot of orange ones yesterday. And when you see them with red spikes, like in the lower right, that is more often than not uh, a specimen from Florida. And I don't know why that is, but they seem to be red spiked in Florida and black spiked over here and elsewhere in the South for that matter. Okay, let me move my, uh, let me move my cursor a little bit. So my screen doesn't look the same as y'all's. So the spider that you're looking at here is called a black and yellow garden spider. And like the golden silk spider, it has the unfortunate uh, nickname of banana spider. This has been a pet peeve of mine for a long time because up until I would say about five years ago, you would not find a credible field guide or website that used the term banana spider at all. And unfortunately, it's creeping into common use a little more. And my issue with it is this. If I call this thing a banana spider and someone else calls this thing a banana spider and oh, by the way, there are big brown spiders that come in on banana plants from South America that are also called banana spiders. All we're doing is setting ourselves up for confusion and bad communication. So we should probably use the approved common names. And by approved, I mean the American Arachnological Society has a common names committee and they vote on common names. And Banana spider isn't one of them for any of these creatures. So now that I've got that out of the way, you can tell I really need to get that off my chest, right? Uh, this is a black and yellow garden spider. And what you'll notice is a thick white zigzag of silk above and below its body. That structure is really fascinating. It was called the stable omentum by the arachnologists that first worked with this animal, I don't know how many uh, years ago, but it was thought that, that that silk was extra strong. And out of all the other silk in the web, this stable omentum was thick and white so that it would strengthen, stabilize uh, the web. And when heavy prey like cicadas and bumblebees and large beetles and grasshoppers and dragonflies would hit this web, and those are all prey items for this animal, um, the web would be less likely to give way because of the stable omentum. Since that time, there are multiple hypotheses that have come along to explain what this is. Some people, and they're not mutually exclusive hypotheses either. Uh, some people have suggested that because it's white, it reflects the sunlight. And if you watch where the spider goes during the course of the day and where the sun tracks, the spider will usually put the stable momentum between itself and the sun. So it is perhaps serving as a shade structure. Others have suggested that the white zigzag is easy to see. And the spider wants this so that birds do not accidentally fly through the web because the bird doesn't want to get, uh, doesn't want to spend time getting the webbing off of its beak and feathers any more than the spider wants to spend the time and have the energetic cost of having to rebuild the web. Uh, but in spite of all of these hypotheses, the most recent one, the most intriguing one to come along, which is about 20 or so years old now, uh, is that the stable momentum, this white silk, and only this white silk reflects ultraviolet light, which is true. We know this to be a fact. And so the hypothesis goes like this. Insects can see ultraviolet light. Flowers reflect ultraviolet light, and many insects use the pattern of ultraviolet light that they see on flowers to locate a flower they want to go to for nectar or pollen. So the insect is looking for a UV pattern to find food. And furthermore, there are insects that use UV patterns that are in the sky to navigate their way back home. So if the web has a UV pattern to it, 
Rather than being a passive sieve, just waiting for insects to bumble into it, the hypothesis goes, this is an elaborate visual trap that is basically catching bugs coming and going. An insect might be looking downwards for a flower, mistake the web for food, or upwards to the sky, mistake the web for the sky, and get caught. And there have been some really neat experiments done to uh, bolster uh, and, and, and reinforce this hypothesis. And I should add, by the way, let me back up. If you ever see the webs of um, spiny backed orb weavers, you will notice that they have around their sticky spirals. And by the way, the spokes are not the sticky part of an orb web. It's only the spirals that are sticky. You'll notice that around their sticky spirals, uh, spiny backed orb weavers have silk that is typical in that it is real thin and hard to see. And then pieces that are a lot whiter. Those are also UV reflective. And these are not the only two spiders that have UV reflective silk in their webs. So it's really very interesting. Of course, golden silk spiders have beautiful webs because they often have uh, a golden or yellowish orange tint to them. And these are big, impressive spiders, or at least the females are big and impressive. I showed you a picture of the male earlier. He is um, markedly unimpressive, unless you're impressed by how small he is. Um, but there's an even smaller spider that hangs out in the webs of both golden silk spiders and black and yellow garden spiders. This is a type of cobweb weaver called a dewdrop spider. And the way that it lives is referred to by ecologists as kleptoparasitism. And as a kleptoparasite, this tiny little spider, when it lives in the web of a larger spider, feeds itself by one of two means. When a mosquito hits the web of a golden silk spider, it is in fact too small for the resident spider to bother with. It won't even go after the mosquito but this little spider will. So it can feed the smaller aerial plankton, if you will, uh, to itself. But also when the golden silk spider has a large prey item like a green June beetle, in this case, these dewdrop spiders will very deftly and sneakily sort of approach from another direction and they will feed on the prey item at the same time as the resident spider is eating. So, uh, that's, a, that's a really neat little thing that you can observe if you uh, check out golden silk spiders. Of course, their season is almost over, but if you get out into some of our moist woods between now and the end of October, you might see a golden silk spider and it might even have some of these little dewdrop spiders in its web. Uh, we saw the long-jawed orb weavers and uh, their wonderfully romantic courtship uh, a little bit earlier. There's some long-jawed orb weavers uh, like that on the left-hand side, but also members of the long-jawed orb weaver family are these beautiful orchard spiders. Uh, I can tell you that many times over the course of the years, people have asked me uh, if orchard spiders are black widows because they will see them outside and the green is muted by shade, so their green color just looks black. And the orange markings on the underside, uh, I don't know, you know, it's not red and it's not an hourglass. So once again, a picky eye for detail will help you distinguish quite well, for example, between the marking that you see on that spider and uh, the one that you would see on, um, on a black widow. I'm just noticing that I, I don't see my widow pictures here. So hang on a minute because I'm in the process of getting worried that I'm missing photographs. I am missing photographs. This this slideshow is supposed to have pictures of widows and I don't see them. My goodness, I I, uh, I may short you guys a little bit here or I may try to find um, I may try to find another set of photographs. Oh, no, there they are. Oof, goodness. OK, I got them. <laughs> that was very strange. Um, my apologies. One of the last of the web building spiders that I wanted to show you all uh, is the southern house spider. Um, that is a relatively new common name for this animal, but the family they belong to are called crevice weavers. And when I was at UNO, um, I was working towards a master's in biology. I, I never ended up writing my thesis, but this was my subject animal. So I could talk your ear off about crevice weavers, but I will just tell you uh, that they are um, spiders that you find almost exclusively in association with human buildings, usually buildings that are not regularly cleaned. So you get them in outbuildings a lot, like sheds, barns, garages, uh, boats, boat sheds. And the web is very woolly and white and easy to see. And it is because they have special structures that hackle the silk 
when it comes out of their body. And so it is uh, on a microscopic scale filled with thousands of little bitty loops. And so on a macroscopic scale, it just looks sort of wooly. And in fact, the capture threads don't work by sticky uh, wet adhesion like most other capture webs. They work by electrostatic forces. Um, the loops are so fine that they basically act like Velcro and things get caught on this web really well. So there's a female on the lower left and a male on the lower right. And you will notice that the male looks a little bit like a recluse. So we will segue here into recluses. And now you can see uh, on these three images that are sort of clustered on the right side, the violin pattern uh, that we were talking about earlier on the top of the head of recluse spiders. It's, it's really more violin-like, uh, I would suggest, on that upper right picture than on the other two, but you get the idea. And you can see that on the male crevice weaver in the upper left, there is a dark mark around the eyes. But you'll notice that he has these very long pedipalps. They're in fact so long that they, they double up on, on themselves. They fold back on themselves. Uh, and the marking really is different. And if you have a specimen that is uh, collected, so it's in a container or that isn't alive, you can always use your handy dandy loop, because remember we, we, we told you 20 minutes ago to go out and buy one, uh, or to <laughs> make sure you have a magnifying glass when you look at spiders up close. You'll see that recluses have six eyes arranged in dyads or pairs. So they have three sets of two eyes and the uh, Crevice weaver has eight eyes, but they are clustered very close together. So just, just to make sure I, I, I make this point, because my friend James and my friend Eric are probably watching this, and I, I should hasten to point this out. Uh, James especially has done a lot of work with recluses and taught me a lot about them. Uh, we have about 13 species of recluses that you can find in the US, one of which is introduced uh, from the Neotropics. But the brown recluse, which is a particular species, Loxosceles reclusa, its stronghold, if you will, is uh, arid regions of the Midwest. Uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, northern Texas, Arkansas. And the brown recluse only ranges down into central Louisiana. And when you get below Alexandria, and in particular, if you find recluses that are here in New Orleans, you are almost certainly looking at another introduced species, the Mediterranean recluse, Loxosceles rufescens. And to my knowledge, we haven't found Loxosceles reclusa uh, in New Orleans, certainly not established the way Loxosceles rufescens is. So you'll notice that up to this point, I was not using the word brown at all. I was just saying recluse. And that's because if you say recluse, you are referring to all of the Loxosceles genera in the US. Uh, and if you find a recluse here, I would suggest to you that it is a Mediterranean recluse in all likelihood and not a true brown recluse. A little bit about widows. Uh, here is a much better photograph of the spiky egg sacs that you see on uh, brown widow spiders. This is likely an African import. Uh, we do not believe, that is to say, the Iraniologists who study this group in particular do not believe that brown widows are native to the United States, but we certainly have them. Uh, you'll notice that the legs are banded. You can almost always see that, even on a dark specimen. They're quite variable. Some brown widows are really, really dark, and people will say to me on occasion, I found the spiky egg sacs, but I'm telling you it's a black widow. Well, I'm telling you, if it's spiky egg sacs, it's not a black widow. It's a brown widow, and you may just be looking at a dark specimen. Um, to our knowledge, spiders do not hybridize. Uh, so we are not seeing, you know, brown widows and black widows mating and having these intermediate forms of egg sacs or coloration. Um, just to make sure I got that out there. You'll also notice the hourglass on these uh, brown widows in these photographs. It's very broad. It doesn't pinch like two distinct triangles, and it's kind of orangish. It's not really red. So contrast that, if you will, to the black widows uh, in, in this photo. There are three species of black widows in the United States. <clears throat> uh, the southern black widow, top left, has a female that has not only a red hourglass, but also a terminal red spot at the end of the top of her abdomen. And that little dot in the middle is actually where her, her spinnerets are. And in contrast, if you look on the right-hand side, you will see that northern widows, often as adults, 
only an adult would make an egg sac, as in that photo. Often the adults have red spots down the center midline of the abdomen into adulthood. Our southern black widows have these dots, but they disappear as the spider molts and grows. But the northern widow will usually retain them or often retain them. And you see in the other photograph where the northern widow has what looks like a maybe a bee or a beetle in its web, you'll notice that the hourglass does not connect. Those two little triangles on the underside of the body right past the legs there, they don't touch. And that is a diagnostic feature on northern widows. And then last we have the western widow and you will notice that it has an hourglass but it does not have a terminal red spot. Now admittedly that's not a great angle you know there could be something behind those spinnerets that you don't see but I, I will tell you that the way you recognize a northern widow is that it has an hourglass and only an hourglass and it is complete. So going counterclockwise the northern widow has a broken hourglass and often but not always red spots down the top of the abdomen and the southern black widow has a complete hourglass and a terminal red spot at the very end of the dorsal part of the abdomen. And after I explain what's going on here, <laughs> I will uh, pause for a moment. Um, I am not a good photographer, but I took both of these pictures. So yay me. Um, I just like these a lot because it highlights the fact that both crab spiders on the right and lynx spiders on the left have venom that will very quickly immobilize prey, including prey that outweighs them and is potentially dangerous to them. These are both ambush predators that tend to be near flowers. So flies, butterflies, moths, bees and wasps make up a lot of their prey and they have evolved venom over the course of time that will instantly immobilize uh, these insects that they feed on, which is pretty cool. Um, and I just got lucky with both of these photos. Now I have to pause here and ask Claudia or Estacia, uh, if 3.30 is our end time, do I have time for about uh, five or 10 minutes more of slides? Because I have absolutely. more slides or yeah, I can stop. Absolutely, yeah, no problem. Okay, in that case, here's something for you to read and I'll let you read and then I'll let you chuckle and then I'll start speaking again. Oh, I can hear everybody laughing. No, I can't because you're all muted. Oh, well, um, usually this this slide just kills. Uh, I wanted to show you some really crazy, interesting outliers in the spider world. Oh, oh a laughy emoji just popped up on my screen. I don't know how I don't know who did that or how, but thank you. Oh, there's another one. That's very clever of you of you guys. Um, so let's talk about the ogre faced spider, also known as the net casting spider. Very unusual animal, uh, slight of build. Uh, I think even when they're well fed, they look malnourished. Uh, they have these very thin abdomens and the ogre faced spider produces this same silk that the crevice weaver produces. Uh, it is not sticky, but it has a lot of fine loops and it, it hangs out upside down on just a couple of strands of silk. It holds on to this silk with its back four legs and with its front four legs, it creates, well, it makes with its spinnerets and then stretches out with its front four legs. It holds a net. It basically has something that looks like a net. And when an insect walks under it, it lunges forward and with its front four legs, it throws this net. It doesn't let go of it, but it pushes this net forward on the insect and grabs it. You can see YouTube videos of this in action. Words really do not do it justice. Um, but that is the net casting spider or the ogre faced spider. Another crazy spider is this little bird dropping mimic, which is called a bolus spider. If you're not familiar with the bolus, it's a weapon that involves uh, two or three balls on the ends of strings and you twirl them around and then you throw them at the legs, uh, typically of some long legged bird and it wraps around them. Uh, there's probably some uh, spy movies that you might have seen where where bad guys did this to, to knock people down as well. But in any case, now you know what a bolus is. The bolus spider is in fact an orb weaver, but it has lost the ability to make an orb web. It has a couple of little strands of silk and then it makes this globule that hangs on a thread. And the or the uh, bolus spider itself 
produces a pheromone that is analogous to female moth pheromones of various species. And so depending on where in the world you are and what bolus spider you're looking at, you will see this animal at night hanging out like the one on the right hand side here and male moths will fly around it thinking that they are smelling a female somewhere in the area. And the bolus spider takes its leg and it twirls this silk with this globule on the end until it thwacks the moth and hits it. And it captures it with that little globule of silk and reels it in and eats it. And here again, I believe YouTube may uh, elucidate this in a really wonderful way for you. We have these spiders right around here, but they're kind of cryptic. They're hard to spot. Uh, the spitting spiders of the world tend to have a very high domed head. And that is because in addition to their venom glands, they have on either side of their head an additional gland, which produces a sticky fluid. And they squirt it out of their fangs onto prey that is walking on the ground in front of them. It can only shoot about a quarter of an inch at the most, but the, the spider is able to sense prey, usually because it hits trip lines that the spider has made, but the trip lines aren't capture threads. They're not sticky. And the spinning spider just sort of walks up to the prey until it's very close. And then in an instant, it squirts this fluid out and it comes out in this, in this random sort of zigzag pattern to pin the prey to the substrate. Now, there's a little more to the story than that, but in a nutshell, that's what spitting spiders do. And we have a couple of species that live uh, in South Louisiana, uh, but count yourself lucky if you bump into one. They're not too common. I mentioned earlier how wonderful jumping spiders are. Typically, they're not big, but some of them are beautifully colored. This is, in fact, the most diverse family of spiders in the world. There are around 45 or 46,000 species of spiders that we know of, and about 4,500 of them, about 10% of them are jumping spiders. So uh, it's obviously a very successful design. Um, and as cool as it is to be brightly colored and to have great eyesight and to leap on your prey, some jumping spiders also are built like ants. This, this is a spider. In fact, it's a jumping spider. And it is a jumping spider that makes a very good living by looking like an ant that also looks like this. This is, this is a spider as well. Let me back up here. You look really closely at this thing. You can see it's got eight legs. And you can see this thing has eight legs, but it's actually got its front two legs held out to look like antennae. And why would you do this? Well, if you're not familiar with ants, the ones that don't sting produce acid, and the ones that don't produce acid are very few in number and usually can bite pretty hard. So ants walk around like they own the joint. You might have noticed this in your day-to-day -day life. Ants don't seem to care who sees them or where they're walking because most of the insect-eating animals in the world leave ants alone. So jumping spiders will look like ants to gain protection from would-be predators. But in addition to that, some of these jumping spiders that look like ants are generalist hunters, like most spiders, and will randomly eat any sort of insect they encounter. But some jumping spiders feed on the very ants that they look like. In this case, our jumping spider is in fact missing a leg, but she's on the left. And Cephalodes atratus is uh, the turtle-headed ant on the right, which she has killed. And she's got her fangs inserted right between the head and the thorax of that ant. Similarly, on the other side of the globe, the weaver ant that is on the bottom of this twig has been killed by, I think in this case, it is a crab spider and not a jumping spider uh, that is mimicking uh, this ant. Um, I have to double check that species. But uh, anyway, it's pretty fascinating stuff going on. And to put the finishing touches on the presentation, I will briefly introduce you to this jumping spider, which is in the genus Portia, P-O-R-T-I-A. Portia is an amazing animal. Uh, we typically do not attribute intelligence, however you might define it, to arthropods. Uh, we tend to think that vertebrates do most of the thinking in the world. And over the course of time, researchers have uh, 
used many different criteria for intelligence of animals. Uh, brain weight to body weight ratio, electrical activity of the brain, um, problem solving. So there's, there's a more modern set of standards and Porsche fits a lot of them. So let me just tell you about this jumping spider. As a jumping spider, you would think, okay, it sees well, it spots an insect, it stalks it, it leaps on it. Well, they can do that, but Porsche can do so much more. Portia will stalk other jumping spiders and kill them. And you notice that she's got all sorts of uh, tufts of hair and, and parts of her body that make her look a little bit like a piece of debris. And when she stalks a jumping spider, if her intended prey turns around and looks at Portia, she freezes in a stereotypic posture that makes her look like a bit of plant debris. And the hunted spider, if I may anthropomorphize, says to itself, oh, must have been the wind and turns around and stops looking at Portia, and Portia then can continue to leap up on and kill her prey. But that's not where the intelligence comes in. The intelligence comes in when Portia hunts for web building spiders. Now, let me back up and say that Portia is a spider eating specialist. Uh, to use a technical term, she is araniophagic. She is spider eating. Uh, I collected a Porsche once in Singapore and I offered her a cricket and a fly and she showed no interest and I put a cobweb weaver in with her and she jumped on it in about five seconds. So what Porsche will do more often than not is go up to the web of a web building spider and pluck on it and she is trying to mimic either a prey item or a potential mate. This is called aggressive mimicry. She is attempting to lure the resident of this web closer to wherever she is doing her plucking and her strumming. And when the resident spider gets close enough, Portia leaps on it and kills it and eats it in the web without getting stuck herself. Well, what's really cool is, let us suppose she goes up to spider species A and she goes pluck, pluck, pluck and nothing works. And then she goes, pluck, pluck, shake, shake, pluck, pluck, shake, shake, and nothing works. And then she goes, shake, pluck, shake, pluck. And the resident spider with that signal comes too close, gets killed and eaten. Well, first of all, Portia has just demonstrated trial and error, which is pretty cool. But in the second place, if Portia a week later does the same thing to a different spider species, she starts her whole trial and error all over again and tries to figure out what works. And if the next week she bumps into spider species A again, the first thing she does is what worked two weeks ago. That's memory, which again, we do not usually attribute to invertebrates. And there's another thing Portia can do. If none of the aggressive mimicry works, Portia will survey the scene and she will look and stare and look and stare and look and stare and she will figure out where she needs to walk to if she can find a perch from which she can simply leap on and kill the resident spider. And when she does this, she makes this great big long detour taking sometimes five to 15 minutes to emerge on the spot that she has remembered. She knows where she wants to go. She's lost sight of her intended victim altogether and emerged on the right spot. And, and that, my friends, is, is a, a very brief summary of Portia. There's quite a lot more to it than that. Um, but I hope that that uh, has gotten you adequately excited about spiders and that I can take 20 minutes or so to answer questions. Something popped up that said, uh, um, you can start putting questions in the queue. I don't know how that works, but I'm gonna turn my camera on and say hi to everybody. And uh, Thanks, someone, Zach. someone Thanks, say sir. something. Yeah, this is me. So this is Claudia. Thanks so much. This is so awesome. So interesting. Uh, but I'm sure there's some folks out there. I don't see any questions right now in the chat. But please, guys, don't be shy. And uh, please add your questions in the chat so we can um, have Zach start answering. All right. And should I hit show conversation where my thing says chat? You can see it if you'd like. We'd read it. We'll read the questions for you. I don't, again, I don't see anything in there right this second. 
But, um, you know, I'm so glad that you, in the meantime, though, I'm really glad that you addressed, you know, being at the city of New Orleans, people have such a phobia, right, about spiders and they misidentify. So I am so glad that you touched on that topic because we are always saying, please identify what, you know, insect or rodent or spider that you have to see if it's even an issue, right? And so this is really, really great. Um, it looks like we did have um, a question here and it says, is the yellow sack spider not living well inside a New Orleans thing? We see them a lot in houses in California. I, I can't answer that uh, because I'm not familiar enough with the spider that you are seeing in California. It may be a sack spider and it may be a different species that does a little better inside of human dwellings. Um, my brother has lived in Los Angeles for mm, 20 something years now. Um, I will admit that uh, he and his wife keep a pretty meticulous house though. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, uh, I don't know of sack spiders being commonly found in, in homes and being robust and well-fed in homes. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it's a New Orleans thing. I think it's a general thing. You may, you may find them in California in houses a lot because there's a big population of them and because they get in houses a lot, but whether they survive in there, I don't know. Um, but that's, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to it. By the way, before I answer, um, I, I see Michael Brooks has a question. I can answer that in a second. The Joro spider uh, is in the photo here that says questions. So I guess everyone can see that photo. Yeah, is that right, Claudia? Yes, you can see it. Yeah. So the Joro spider is a relative of our golden silk spider. And uh, it is not from this part of the world. And it apparently has popped up in Georgia. I don't think its population is hugely well established yet, uh, but it remains to be seen, um, you know, whether or not we'll end up with, with a lot of this additional spider, which, I mean, it's beautiful, but it doesn't belong here. So there is that. All right. Is it common for cobweb spiders to play dead when you antagonize them, or is that only brown widows? No, it's common with, with a, a lot of cobweb weavers. If you disturb them when they're in their web and they realize that whatever you are, you're a big bad predator and they're, they're not going to just be able to hide, they'll pull their legs in and drop to the ground. Uh, widows do that. Uh, American house spiders do that. Um, and uh, so does stay a that that uh, that uh, the other the other cobweb weaver I showed a picture of near the beginning. OK, uh, the next question says, how many poisonous spiders are a bite concern for humans in southern Louisiana besides widows and recluses? Um, uh, widows and recluses are the only spiders we have in South Louisiana that have venom that is medically significant to people. Uh, and we use the term venomous instead of poisonous. Uh, this is just a, a point of clarification for everybody. Um, when we say something is venomous, that means it has an active way of getting a toxin into you, like with a stinger or a spine or a fang. Uh, so it, it, it actively delivers the poison. If something is poisonous, you have to do the work of uptaking it by inhaling it, ingesting it, or getting it on the surface of your skin. And by way of example, you never hear of a venomous mushroom. You hear of poisonous mushrooms. So we don't call spiders poisonous, we call them venomous. And as we said earlier, most of them are venomous, but only a few of them are medically significant to humans. And in South Louisiana, it's just widows and recluses. All right. Some people claim that steatotas are dangerous. What is your opinion on this? My opinion is that those people are incorrect. Uh, I've, ne I've, I've never heard that before or seen it. I also think steatota might be too weak to even break the skin. Uh, its fangs might be too small to even deliver a bite. Uh, I've put enough in my hands and never been bitten by one. Joro spider is well noted in the South Carolina upstate and is being observed in Georgia. We at Clemson and Extension encourage logging observations in EDD maps and iNaturalist. I, I'm familiar with iNaturalist, uh, embarrassed to say I haven't really gotten on it yet, but I'm, I'm very familiar with it uh, and I like it. Um, I don't know what EDD maps is. So if um, Vicki wants to write back and let us know what that is, uh, certainly to your point, Vicki, 
uh, and thank you for letting me know they're in South Carolina also because I didn't know that. Um, anytime we have something that is adventive, that is new in an area, and we are wondering if it's going to become established and subsequently become problematic, i.e. invasive, uh, we want as many eyes on it as possible. So taking photographs and submitting those uh, to different uh, experts that can identify the organism, whether it's a plant or an animal, is a, is a good idea. So <clears throat> that's, a, that's an expansion on what Vicky has taught us, which is that they're in South Carolina. <clears throat> EDD Maps is an app from the University of Georgia's Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. So that's another way you guys can uh, upload information about Joro spiders if you see them. Thanks. All right. I had a question, Zach. Can you talk about how to tell if a brown recluse or a black widow has bitten you? Is there an easy way to tell that? You know, I avoided all of the medical stuff entirely, mainly because of time. Uh, so let me start by saying that both widows and recluses have fangs that are so small that the bite usually is unnoticed. And this begins our series of problems uh, when trying to diagnose it. Uh, no doctor worth his or her diploma would agree that you got bitten by a snake unless you saw the snake, felt the snake, and had one or two holes in you. And yet, without any of these smoking guns, people will present some set of symptoms to medical professionals, and the default guess is often spider bite without proof, uh, which is not to say that you can't have a spider bite that's dangerous, but you don't want to misdiagnose something because then you don't treat it properly. So what I can tell you is that of the cases that I've read about where the bite was confirmed, widows typically cause intense pain throughout the body within about one to six hours. Uh, it is a systemic problem because it is a neurotoxic bite. And since your nervous system goes all over your body, it doesn't matter whether you were bitten on your forehead or on your heel, you're going to have these muscle cramps and aches and pain throughout the body, as well as other symptoms uh, that, that vary in how common they are from individual to individual. Um, that would be typical of a bad reaction for a widow bite. Recluse bites, uh, because it is a hemotoxic uh, venom, it's going to have a localized reaction. And what you normally get with recluses is a raised blister and then a bullseye pattern, a little, a little uh, red and white, and maybe purplish streaking in a circular pattern around, around the wound. And when the blister sinks in and, and, and the bullseye is there, you eventually get this little asterisk shaped uh, little indentation like a scab, like a, like a dark purplish scab that falls off. And all of that will take place within a few days if you have a normal bad course of action uh, uh, from a recluse bite. And then you have an open wound. And the problem with recluse bites is that the open wound doesn't heal and you subsequently can run the risk of getting a staph infection or, uh, or gangrene or some, or some other kind of infection from having an open wound that doesn't heal. Um, so the, the problem is that there are about 18 other things that can present with this blistering uh, and, this, and this bullseye pattern, uh, and, and particularly with this open wound that aren't recluse bites. Uh, and there's a guy named Rick Vetter uh, who has kind of made a career uh, at looking into this. And you can uh, perhaps look up Rick Vetter online and look at all of these things that aren't recluse bites that, that can look like to a, to a medical professional a potential recluse bite. Um, so that's a bit of an answer to that. I now see some other questions here too, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get to them. Uh, let's see. Emily says, "How do spiderlings disperse after hatching?" Most spiders will disperse by ballooning. They will go to the tip of a leaf or the tip of a stem. They will put their abdomen in the air and they will let a little bit of silk out. They have little claws on the ends of their legs that help them hold on to stuff. But as soon as the wind, and, and it doesn't have to be a lot of wind, it can be an imperceptible breeze to you and I. But as soon as those strands of silk are being caught by air, the spider releases its grip and the wind carries it and it lands wherever it lands. Now, there are groups of spiders, specific families or species within those families that do not balloon and they will disperse simply by crawling away from their natal area, from, from the area where they were born. Um, so that's how spiderlings disperse, and it usually is about a week or so after hatching. 
Uh, and the follow up is, do any spiders care for their young? Yes, there are spiders that care for their young. And um, we could go down a little rabbit hole, but the short answer is maternal care is not the norm in spiders, but we do see it. Uh, some t there are some spiders that are semi-social and the spiderlings feed collectively along with older animals that are in the same large communal web. And uh, there are some spiders in which the female, the mother intentionally feeds herself. She's at the end of her life anyway. She wants her genes to get passed along through healthy individuals. And presumptively, this is how this behavior evolved. Uh, she, she sacrifices herself and the spiderlings feed on her. Um, I believe this is a, a hackled mesh weaver that's known for this. Um, okay, next we have, what is my favorite spider? I can't pick a favorite spider. I have lots of spiders that I love too much to pick a favorite spider. Um, but you can tell I like Portia a lot. Uh, if a brown widow gets out of her way to escape, instead of playing dead, could it mean that she's older? I've caught two and only the lighter and smaller one played dead. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, being lighter in color versus darker in color isn't a function of age though. Uh, you can simply have lighter and darker colored brown widows. What I, what I will tell you is that, well, what I will guess, I won't tell you, I will guess that a brown widow that is guarding egg sacs, I think will be less likely to drop and play dead and more likely to try to stay in her web so that she is proximal to and not abandoning her egg sacs. That's just a guess though. How do you treat spider bites? Um, I don't know that there is a whole lot of good first aid out there for spider bites. Uh, you know, spider bites themselves are not very common. Uh, I always like to remind people that, uh, you know, you're not swallowing eight spiders a year in your sleep. And if you wake up and you've got bumps on your body, spiders should be one of the last things that you sus suspect is having caused it. Spiders don't bite us for food. Uh, none of them do, uh, like mosquitoes and ticks and horse flies and on and on. Um, so when you're bitten by a spider, it's usually because you have accidentally or purposefully restrained its movement. Uh, you've pushed up against it, you've captured it in your hand, uh, it got its leg caught or its body caught somehow between you and your clothing. And so uh, typically uh, if you're bitten by a spider and it's one whose venom is not dangerous to people, you're not gonna have anything to worry about. Um, but off the top of my head, I do not know of any spider first aid recommendations. It's prob they're probably out there, but I don't know what they are and, and how uh, efficacious they are. And Astacia found something by Vetter about recluses. Yep, that's him. I will have to say he's on a, he, he, he's a bit of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he's very zealous about, uh, you know, making sure that people understand how uncommon recluse bites are. And uh, he really wants us to be correct when we say a recluse got me. Zach, I have a, right. I have a question so or comment. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're, you know, in my house, right? And I find the little spiders in the corners and, you know, what would you recommend somebody do for, for pest control? Oh, 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 I thought you were getting ready to invite <laughs> me to your house finally. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so um, I actually have a book by a colleague of mine named Stoy Hedges called Urban Spiders, and he and he is a, an urban entomologist by training and, and uh, can adv can advise on that. If you if you get this book, it's by PCT Pest Control Technologies, mm -hmm. and it's called Urban Spiders by Stoy Hedges. Um, my general thought is that most people don't have so many spiders in their home that it is unsightly. But for some people, they're phobic and they, they can't handle a spider in their house. For some people, any animal in the house shouldn't be in the house, so it ought to be removed. And then everyone has a threshold, like, oh, there's one spider in the corner of one windowsill, live and let live. Oh no, there's 20 spiders in every single corner that I look at, I have a problem, I got too many spiders in the house. Um, I like to recommend live removal. So if there's a way for you to gently and delicately collect a spider that you see in your house, stick it in a vessel like a cup or some other container and just let it go outside, that's the way to do it. Uh, if you are hell bent on killing spiders, uh, any pest control operator should be able to help you, 
but uh, you can spray them with insecticidal stuff, but it has to hit the spider. Um, if you just sort of generally spray an area and hope that a spider will come into contact with that spray or that it will persist long enough to kill the spider, uh, chances are you'll, you'll get disappointed and you won't really gain control of your spider problem. Um, you can kill spiders with what we call direct compression, which is a, a fancy way of saying crushing the animal. I don't like to do that. Uh, but, you know, if you have a pair of forceps, you know, tweezers, and you can see the spider and grab it, uh, you can kill a spider that way. But I never, I never vote for killing spiders. I can certainly understand any number of uh, people who don't want them uh, in their house, uh, but uh, it's uh, nice to let them live. And remember, you know, because for and, a lot of people, right? So we we vacuum. So a lot of times we knock down webs or vacuum as well is another way. But you know, the the other thing too is for people to see what they're feeding on, especially from a pest control standpoint, right? Yeah, they're not going to be there. You will not have spiders well established in your house unless you have insect prey for them already yeah. also established in your house. Okay. So. Um, I, I always tell people, you know, if you've got a huntsman spider on your wall, you should you should be happy because you don't have as many roaches as you would have on your wall. Um, so there's that. Um, so there's two questions. Um, my buddy Eric said, where did all the Mactans go in New Orleans? I will tell you, Eric, we must not have had this conversation before. Um, I'm 54. I grew up here. I never found black widows in the middle of New Orleans. I found a couple in Kenner once on the levee at the edge of Rivertown. And I know our friend James found some out in Kenner and that's very few in number and the closest to New Orleans proper that I've ever found widows. Latridectus mactans, the Southern black widow. Um, if you have some knowledge that 20, 30, 40 years ago, more black widows were generally found in and around New Orleans, that would be news to me and I would not still have an answer to your question, which is where do they all go? I don't know. Um, I, I know that I'm very good at spotting widow webs and have been for a long time. And I, I've, I've never seen them around the city. Uh, how many folks have arachnophobia? I don't know. That's a, that's a very good question. I talk to people who are arachnophobic regularly and I try to you know change their attitude, calm them down a little bit. Phobias are very difficult things to tackle. Uh, as the psychologists of the world or psychiatrists will tell you. Um, but uh, I don't know what percentage of the population is, is, is technically arachnophobic. Do spiders eat ticks? That is a really good question. I've never had that question in my life. Um, I've never seen a picture of a spider eating a tick. I've never come across a spider eating a tick. I've never tried to feed ticks to spiders because I've never had a lot of ticks in my possession one way or the other, like on my person or in a collection. Um, I would imagine that there are spiders that eat ticks, and I would guess that there are probably some that specialize in ticks, because if there are 45 or so thousand species of spiders out there in the world, you might think that there's at least one that goes after ticks in general. Um, I've certainly never read anything that said spiders are good for tick control, and very often you hear that spiders are good for insect control, whether that's insects in your house, insects in agricultural fields, which is a very well studied uh, uh, subject, you know, the control of, of insects by spiders in agricultural fields. Um, mm, do spiders eat ticks? Cool. All right. Um, and we're at 3.30, so that All might right. be it. Zach? Thank you so much. Stacy's going to bring up a few slides and look for the folks that have not, um, you know, completed our our survey. She's going to bring it up here in a minute. But Zach, we can't thank you enough. I knew this is going to be a fantastic webinar. So thanks again. Talk. Hey, would you mind mentioning a little bit about the Audubon Insectarium? Oh yeah, thanks. Um, gosh, I hope we still have fifty something people here. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see the number. Oh, they're dropping off fast. Don't go yet. There's more. Uh, Audubon Butterfly Garden and Insectarium was in the U.S. Custom House for 12 years uh, between what 08 and 2020 when the pandemic hit and even before the pandemic we were trying to figure out how we could physically move into the aquarium. Uh, that process is now well underway uh, and so we will be where the giant screen theater used to be on the second floor and we are targeting June of 2023 to reopen and we hope we will see everyone at that museum. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me say that and reminding me to. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll let us stay here. Wrap it up.
OK, everyone, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm sharing the QR code that um, Dr. Regal was just mentioning for our professional survey. If you point your camera, your phone camera at it and open your camera, it'll take you to the link to complete the survey. If you have any additional questions for Zach and think of them later, please email us at education at NOLA. Gov. And if you want to be added to our mailing list for future webinars, you can email us there too. Once again, thank you everyone for joining. Have a great day. Thanks guys. Bye-bye.